You can turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Hebrews, chapter 4. Continue our journey through the Word of God in the book of Hebrews tonight. And as you turn there, uh, if I were to ask you, how many of you have experienced a significant level of stress in your life recently? Did I see a show of hands? Well, those of you who are raising your hands are the honest ones. The other ones are keeping their stress to themselves. <laughs> you know, when we go through stressful times, boy, there are some passages in the Word of God that have an amazing way of just jumping off the page at us. One of them uh, can almost seem a little ironic to us living in stressed out times like these. It's found in John chapter 14 and verse 27. There Jesus said this, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Boy, what a contrast to the way most people are living their lives these days. There is so much stress going on, and you know, it might be helpful for us before uh, we launch into this passage in Hebrews chapter 4 about God's rest to get a handle on what stress is really all about. Stress in our lives is a reaction uh, to circumstances, to emotions, even to memories we might have that produces within us what's called the fight or flight reaction. God has wonderfully created us with the ability to have a surge of energy when we've got to beat feet, when we've got to get out of harm's way, that's what that stress reaction is all about. And in its proper place, it is uh, really wonderful for survival. If you're crossing the street uh, and you are in the, the crosswalk and you are going right along with the light, but someone decides to run the light at you, it's a good thing to have that energy surge to get out of harm's way. The problem that we run into in our society is this. Instead of experiencing that flight or fight reaction, uh, the surge of adrenaline that fills our system, there's another hormone called cortisol that floods into us. We have that fight or flight reaction. Instead of experiencing it appropriate to a particular challenge, well, these days, that fight or flight reaction seems to play like background music in our hearts and in our minds. It's always going. And when you are always hyped up on adrenaline, when you have that cortisol going on uh, within your body in a continual way, even in a low-level way, but a continual way, well, it begins to do some damage. Maybe your stress is created by financial demands. Maybe it's created by a little too much indulgence in social media. Maybe it's created by relationships that seem to be going sour. And the more you invest in them, the farther afield they seem to go. Uh, let's face it, uh, in our get-it-done-yesterday deadlines and the demands that we have, just keeping up in society today, stress can become a lifestyle for us. And we as Christians are not immune. You know, one of the most devastating forms of stress that I have seen in my walk with God, especially in my experience in ministry, uh, has been stressed out Christians. And they aren't just stressed out because there's a lot of things going on horizontally in their lives. Uh, oftentimes, the most stressed out Christians <coughs> that I encounter are individuals who are stressed out because they believe that God has an unending list of demands and requests and uh, qualifications for a relationship with Him that they just aren't measuring up to. And when you've got the ultimate taskmaster in heaven who is looking at you with a sneer on his face and a long bony finger saying, boy, you better get your act together or it's straight to H-E double hockey sticks with you. Let me tell you something. That is a stressful set of circumstances. I can't tell you how many people I have run into in the Christian life 
who will come up to me after a service and have a look in their eyes like a scared horse, who will say things to me like, we're just not doing enough for the kingdom. And, and I, you know, I, I thought I lost my salvation because instead of going down to the U of A mall and sharing my faith, I went to the movies instead. Oh, wow. Doesn't sound to me like you're worshiping God the Father. It sounds to me like you're worshiping the Godfather when you've got that kind of burden on you. But there's all kinds of people that have maybe not that extreme reaction to what they consider the demands of God, but that background kind of noise, that background kind of stress, that uneasy sense that all is not well between themselves and God. And so instead of entering into one of God's greatest blessings, entering into his rest, they find themselves in a perpetual state of spiritual restlessness. I've got good news for you tonight. If that describes you, if you've ever gone through a stretch in your walk with God of spiritual restlessness, if you've ever wondered when it's all said and done, uh, is it going to be well with you on that day you see Jesus face to face? Here's the good news. God wants to give you rest. He wants to get you off the stressed out spiritual crazy train. And in Hebrews chapter 4 tonight, we're going to see exactly how God desires to do that kind of work within our lives. Now, in order to understand what's going to be going on in Hebrews chapter 4, if you're with us in Hebrews chapter 3, we see that the writer of Hebrews, and and if you're familiar with the book of Hebrews, you've been with us in our study, you know that the writer of Hebrews is addressing a group of Jewish Christians who are finding themselves saying, wow, uh, when someone told me that Jesus was the promised Messiah, when they provided for me all this evidence that he fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures and, and rose from the dead to guarantee that he is in fact the one whom God has promised, I thought that was great. But now I'm discovering something. There's a price to be paid for my faith. The other people in the synagogue, which was the epicenter of Jewish life, are looking at me and saying, if you accept Jesus, you can't hang out here anymore. If you put your faith in Jesus as Messiah, you can't have business contacts anymore. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, well, I know some Roman officials who might be interested in that, and they have some fines and levies that might encourage you to reconsider that position well there were all kinds of people at this point when persecution was just beginning to break that were saying well maybe enough's enough maybe i'll just go back to where i was before to the friendly confines of judaism i can go back to the temple Oh, you know, the smells and bells there in the temple and and all that we used to enjoy, the the pomp and the circumstance of seeing the sacrifices done and the festival days, being able to be there and to be able to go home and know that all was right between me and God and, and, well, even with my fellow Jewish neighbors. Those were the days they forgot exactly what Jesus had done for them. And we're beginning to turn back to Judaism. The writer of Hebrews says, no way, man. Uh, When it comes to following Jesus, it's a one-way trip. It's burn the boats. It's uh, time to follow him no matter what. And the writer of Hebrews is making a case to a number of different individuals in this one Jewish community. There were those who were sold out And we're willing to follow Jesus no matter the cost. And you'll see in Hebrews just these wonderful encouragements to them to keep on keeping on. There were also those in that same community who were opposed to the idea of Jesus being Messiah. And the writer of Hebrews does a masterful job of weaving together all these beautiful Old Testament pictures and showing how you really can't understand uh, the word of the, the Lord without understanding that Jesus is the Lord who is the word. But there were also those who were on the fence, those individuals that were going, ah, yeah, uh, I, I could, yeah, I'm certainly favorably persuaded that all that's true, but boy, I'm just not sure I'm willing to pay that price. And his message to them has been time to commit, time to go all the way. 
And so uh, the writer of Hebrews paints this picture, not only of who Jesus is and, and how Jesus is greater than the angels. He is greater than Moses. He is greater than Joshua and the, the rest that Joshua provided. But he is also saying that uh, Jesus has brought you to a very familiar place in, in many ways, especially if you were a Jewish person and you understood Jewish history. What he was saying is you are almost identically in the same spot spiritually as our forefathers were when they came to the edge of the promised land. Remember that story? Way back in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, the spies returned from taking a look at Canaan. The good news is, yeah, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. They even brought back some of the produce of the land, a cluster of grapes that was so big they had to carry it on kind of a gurney between two people. And the minority report, Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, it's everything God promised it to be. The majority report, unfortunately, 10 spies said, oh, we saw the land. It's a land of walled cities. It's a land that devours its inhabitants. And we even saw the Nephilim there, these giants in the land. And when the people heard it, all the congregation, Numbers chapter 14, verse 1, lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, If only we died in the land of Egypt. If only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us out to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select a leader and return to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell on their face before God in front of the whole congregation, Joshua and Caleb said, no, 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 you don't understand. If God's with us, it doesn't matter who's against us. We can go in, we can take the land. But all the congregation took up stones to stone them. And if the glory of God had not appeared and intervened, uh, it would have been a complete disaster. And so the people, six inches away from a miracle, because of unbelief, turned away from entering into the promised land, the promised rest that God had for them. And the writer of Hebrews, if you were with us in Hebrews chapter 3, points out that this same principle of being six inches away from a profound and tremendous blessing from God was something that his audience was on the edge of doing. And, and by extension, we can find ourselves on the edge of doing. Six inches away from God's peace. Six inches away from God's rest. Six inches away from living a completely different lifestyle than the stressed out, get it done yesterday, flood your mind with all kinds of garbage from the internet, staying awake all night because your brain is just buzzing with all of the input that you've taken in throughout the day your adrenals firing away, your cortisol going through the roof, stress playing away in the back of your mind like elevator music. God says, I've got something better for you than that. I've got my peace. And you're six inches away from entering in. How do you enter in? Well, that's where we pick things up in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. Therefore, that's what the therefore is there for, since a promise remains of entering His rest, let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. That is referring to the people of Israel on the edge of the promised land. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who believed do enter that rest, as he has said. Now, a couple things jump off the page here. Notice the writer of Hebrews says, let us fear that some of you come short of this. You're, you're six inches away from God's greatest blessing. Let us fear. Now, when we hear the term fear, uh, you know, a lot of us, especially in Christian circles these days, particularly maybe those of you who come from, you know, a really religious-oriented background where uh, the fear of God, 
uh, was, was just the daily diet of your, your spiritual banquet each and every day, that, that, that you were portrayed as uh, Jonathan Edwards did in his sermons, sinners in the hands of an angry God as being like a spider on the edge of a little thread with God hanging you over a fire and just getting ready to shake you off. Hey, that's the way you looked at God. And you hear this term, let us fear. You're like, oh, man. Uh, I'm so glad I got out of those uh, circumstances, so glad I got off that bad teaching, that God's bias was that I not make it to heaven, or, or if I made it in, oh, all right, I guess i got to let you in. I don't, you know, I guess I love you, but I don't really like you very much. So, you know, there's all kinds of people that have that perspective about God. And when they hear the term fear in Scripture, they go, oh, no, no don't put a fear trip on me. Here's a fear trip you want to take believe it or not. Let us fear, lest any of you come short of God's rest. If you're going to be fearful of something, be fearful of this. Be fearful of how easy it is to let faith in ourselves and what we think is right take the place of faith in God and what He has shown us He's right. Be afraid. Be very afraid, like they say, in the movies. Let us fear, lest any of you should come short of it. The word come short of it there in the original language is really vivid. It carries the idea of coming in second place in a race. There's only one winner in this race. And, and if you, uh, you know, are second, you know, I, I had a coach who used to tell us that second place was first loser. And that seemed a little harsh <laughs> in a sense. But, but in a way, he had a point. There's only one winner in a race. You know, and what the writer of Hebrews is saying, if you come short of this, uh, you're not winning. You're losing. You're losing something very, very important. And understand, what he's saying is this. Look, I know you look back at the people of Israel on the edge of the promised land, six inches away from going on in, turning their backs on God, even after having seen him part the Red Sea, having defeated the most powerful army in the face of the earth and the Egyptians having done all these amazing things, having spoken on Sinai, having heard the voice of God in such a profound way, they were like, ah, oh, Moses, you go up and talk to him because if he keeps talking, we're going to die. They'd seen all of this, and yet they come to the promised land and said, there's big guys there. Oh, ho, ho, we're done. Let's get out the rocks and stone them. I knew it. God was just setting us up. He just brought us out here because he wanted to just uh, kill us and our little children. And Oh, that Moses, let's go get him. Boy, human nature in its flaming flower. They had the gospel preached to them. Joshua and Caleb said, God can do it. God plus one equals a majority. And yet, and yet, the gospel is preached to us as well. What he's saying is, you look back on those people and go, how could they be so hard-hearted? How could they look at all this rock-solid evidence? that God was really behind all of this. How could they do something like that and yet turn away? Oh, those poor, pathetic people back then. Aren't we glad we're so far ahead? You know, right years ago, wake up, man, because you're standing in their sandals right now. Spiritually, you are walking in their shoes. They had the gospel, pre we had the gospel preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They had all the information. They had all the evidence. But the key thing is faith. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6, we're going to see that in a few chapters. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For the one who comes to him must believe that he is and is a rewarder of those who seek him. What God asks us to do in the Christian life is believe in Him. But it was not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As He has said, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, this idea of what God's rest is all about is such a crucial thing to understand that the writer Hebrews is going to give us three vivid illustrations of what this rest is and what it is not. Because he doesn't want any of us to miss it. Very vivid Old Testament pictures of what the rest of God is all about. 
these three Old Testament illustrations, the first we find here is an illustration that tells us an important aspect of what God's rest is. It's a picture of the fact that God's work of saving us and the relationship that we have with Him that is based on rest and peace, not on doing more for God, but relying more on what God has done for us uh, and leaving all of our good works and good efforts behind as far as making us right with God. It's illustrated first, believe it or not, in the creation itself. He says, for this, so I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now, he's emphasizing the word rest here, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way. And God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Now, the writer of Hebrews says this. Look, when we talk about the rest of God, I know when you think about rest, you're probably thinking in a Jewish sense of the Sabbath rest. Work six days, take one day off on the Sabbath. Because, again, that's the pattern that God showed in creation. But what he's saying is this, the rest that God uh, uh, demonstrates for us in terms of his creation shows us that this rest relationship with God is based upon the finished and completed work of God on our behalf and nothing, nothing, nothing can add to it. In the Gospel of John, chapter 19 and verse 30, we are told that as Jesus was about to die, amazing words came from his lips. He said these profound words after being on the cross for six hours, three hours in total darkness, crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me when the sin of the world was placed upon him? And then he cried out, it is finished. What was finished? Your redemption and mine, the ability to enter in to a genuine relationship with God. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is just as we see in the creation of the entire universe, this picture of God doing this work and then resting from that work when it was completed. So we see in the work of redemption, God completing the work and resting. There's nothing you can do to add to it. Not going back to the temple not observing sacrifices, not keeping kosher laws, not going back to your religiosities and your self-righteousness. Just as God rested in the creation, so we rest, if you will, in the finished work of Jesus Christ. Now, notice there's another illustration that follows on its heels. Look at verse 5. It's not just an illustration in the Old Testament of the creation. It's also an illustration of the continuation of this rest being available. Look at verses 5 through 7. It says this. (laughs) I love the way he writes this. For he's spoken in a certain place of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, that is God's rest, And those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Again, he designates a certain day, saying in David. You might want to underline that. Today, after such a long time as it's been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. See, we leap into the future. We go from Numbers chapter 14, roughly around 14... 100 B.C. or so. Another 400 and some years to the time when David wrote the Psalms. And as David was writing the Psalms, Psalm 95, you can read through the whole thing on your own time, God inspired him to write these words today if you hear his voice. Not back then if you hear his voice. Not, oh, gee, you know, those poor pathetic souls on the edge of the promised land and weren't they a bunch of screw-ups and aren't we better than they are? No, he's saying, look, today, it's always an open question. Are we going to enter into the fullness of God's blessing, the fullness of God's peace, the fullness of God's provision? The only way you enter in is the same way they had to enter in, and that is through trusting in God and His work alone. Because they had a point. It was up to Israel to take over the promised land. They weren't so big and bad that they could do it on their own. 
I mean, if you don't believe that's true, read through the book of Joshua and Judges and see how far short they fell when they relied on their own strength. No, the only way they were going to be able to do that is if God had provided for them. And, and so just as it was true back then, what David is saying, it is true in my day as well. Again, there is still a rest. Today, it's available for us. And God is saying to us in our stressed out times, today, there is still a rest available for you. Now, maybe you feel very restless spiritually. Maybe you feel very overwhelmed by your circumstances. Maybe you look at what's going on in this world and, you know, you, you dip your toe in the Internet and look at the, the headlines and you go, man, there's an awful lot to be stressed about. Yeah, that's true. But it really kind of comes down to how you look at it. Now, I'm not suggesting that we become a bunch of ignoramuses and ignore what's happening in our, our, our country, even in our own personal lives. But what I am suggesting is this. When you enter into God's rest, you realize something. God has already done the heavy lifting. The, the, the greatest problem that you and I will ever have has already been solved by God. What is that problem? Sin and separation from God forever. You know, I love what Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and 32 says about this. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who will be against us? If he didn't spare his only son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not along with him freely give us all things? <laughs> you, you realize what the beauty of that argument is. What Paul is saying is, look, uh, if God gave his son to save us, then all these other things that we get so wigged out about, small potatoes to God, small potatoes. When you look at life and circumstance, when you look at the condition of the world, you look at your personal life, you look at your relational life. You look at the things that are most frustrating to you, the things that get your adrenaline and, and your, your cortisol going to epic levels in your heart and your mind. You take a step back and go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Why am I so stressed? You know, why pray when I can worry? Well, wait a minute. <laughs> Maybe I need to reverse that. Maybe I need to remember that there is a God who loves me immensely and intensely, whose arm is not short, who is not unable to save, who is not unable to answer prayer, who does have a purpose and a plan for our lives. And when we realize that, we realize today I can enter that rest. Today I can say, God, <laughs> I can rest in the fact that you're God and I'm not. And that's a great arrangement. I can rest in the fact that you promised that I can cast my cares upon you because you care for me. Today, I can enter into that rest. And what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, just as we see this rest was completed and accomplished when Jesus died for us on the cross, just like the creation was completed and God rested, so redemption was completed and God rested. We can't add anything to that. So we see that there's a continual invitation by God to enter into that rest-based relationship with Him. And notice there's a third illustration here. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. He's referring again to David. He's saying if, if Joshua led them into the promised land after 40 years of wilderness wandering, finally that group of clowns that uh, thought that uh, God had just set them up on the edge of the promised land, the last one of them dies off. The ones that said, oh, you just brought us out here to kill our kids. Well, God said, no, your kids are going to live. You, not so much. You're going to die in the wilderness. If you couldn't enter in. Your kids will, but you won't. And God was true to his promise. The children entered in. But this wasn't the rest that God was referring to here. If Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterwards have spoken of another day. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, I think it's fascinating here, especially when we realize that we're talking to a Jewish audience here in the book of Hebrews. The word Joshua is brought up. Uh, you know, that was Jesus' name, too. Did you know that? Yeshua, 
Joshua. That was the name that God instructed Mary and Joseph to give to Jesus. It literally means Yahweh is salvation. And so there's a real play on words here. What, what the writer of Hebrews is saying is, you know what? There was an inferior Joshua who led the people into an inferior rest. Why? Because that inferior Joshua, as great as he was, and the rest that he accomplished, as awesome as that was, as far as the nation of Israel was concerned, going into the promised land, shoot, God even parted the waters of the Jordan River so they could go in and realize that God had done this awesome work. Can't hold a candle to the greater rest, the greater Yeshua, Jesus, would accomplish for us. There remains, therefore, a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. Now, we've got to understand what's being talked about here. What is being referred to here is the basis of our relationship with God. It's not saying that once we become Christians, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, I prayed the prayer. I filled out a comment card. I raised my hand at an altar call. And now it just doesn't really even matter what I do with my life because, uh, you know, I, I got my in, eternal insurance policy I think filled out here. You know, I, I, I signed on the line. No, it's not saying that. And there's a lot of people that get that confused. They, they, they look at the grace of God as some kind of license to steal. See how much you could get away with stuff. There's even some Christian songs that unfortunately seem to emphasize that point in a troubling kind of a way. But the bottom line is this. Ceasing from works means that I approach God, understand this, not on the basis of what I do for Him, but only on the basis of what He has done for me. And let me tell you something. That makes all the difference in the world. It's the difference between serenity and spiritual stress. It's the difference between being one of those scared horse looking uh, people that, oh, I'm not doing enough for God, and, and oh man, I didn't, I only read three chapters in the Bible instead of four chapters, and I did four chapters yesterday, so God must not love me enough today. Do you realize what happens when we fall into that trip and that trap? What we're saying is, is that I can do something, little old me. It's going to cause God to love me less. And if I, conversely, follow through on my devotions and share my faith and put something in the agape box and, you know, do all these wonderful things, that somehow when I do that, and, and, and I, I just want you to breathe this in right now because you can almost smell the sulfur, God loves us a little more, you see. And when you start to buy into that, when that starts to creep into your life on little cat's feet, guess what? You're signing up for your membership in the Junior Pharisee Club. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, gee, what am I going to do with my life? I know I want to be an insufferable religious prig who sits around and sneers at other people and evaluates them and tries to figure out who's godly and who's not. Don't you want to love Jesus like I do? <laughs> people don't wake up in the morning and say, that's what I want to be. But a lot of people wake up one morning and say, that's what I become. How do you become trapped in self-righteousness? You forget the only righteousness that matters, the only rest that will cause your adrenaline, cause your cortisol to come down is the rest that we enter into when we focus in on what Jesus has done for us, not on what we do for him. And it's not as easy as it sounds. If your experience is like mine, your mileage may vary, but this is how Satan usually gets me going on that. He usually starts, not when I'm doing bad, when I'm doing good. You know, I, I, I have a, a prayer time where I say, oh man, Lord, that was so awesome. Yeah, I just felt like, like I could reach out and touch your face. 
You know, I, I, I have a time in God's word. I go, wow, Lord, it just blew off the page of me now. And there were just wisdom and insights I've never seen before in your word. Oh, it's just so awesome. And, you know, or, or you know, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time. And, and there's a person sitting there who's just despondent going, oh, if only somebody would tell me how I could be right with God. And I'm going, that you want me to share with that? Oh, okay. And man, they're falling off the vine, ready to receive Jesus. I just come over with my little bushel basket and boop, right in the kingdom of God. I go, I led someone to Jesus today. 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 Well, what a good boy am I. And I, you know, it's never in the front of my brain, but it's in the back of my brain. I pray for a half an hour one day, and then Satan gets me. Because the next day, I pray, and I seek the Lord, and I look over the clock, and it's been 25 minutes. Ooh, 25 minutes. I didn't pray the whole half hour like I did yesterday. So I guess I'm not as spiritual as I was yesterday. And Satan's right there going, yeah, you know, you did good yesterday, but boy, today, you're just not, man, you better just fill up that next five minutes and get your half an hour in. And you pray and you do your half an hour, right? And you grind it out. And then you run into somebody else and you say, yeah, I, I prayed for a half an hour today. And they go, oh, you know, that's great you have that half an hour prayer time. But me, I just, you know, talk to the Lord as I, I go through my day. Oh, oh, really? You don't have half an hour prayer time with God. Oh, you know, I just don't know how anybody could call themselves a Christian and not have a half an hour prayer time with God. And before too long, you see what's happened? It's like Satan puffs me up and then he's got a big pin to pop my inflated ego. How does he sucker me in? He suckers me in the same way, quite frankly, he suckers you in. He gets you depending on what you do for God as your source of peace instead of what Jesus did for you. And understand something. I, I'm not saying that a relationship with Jesus isn't going to lead you to want to spend time with God in prayer. It's not, I'm not saying that having a relationship with Jesus isn't going to get you to the place where you're going, man, Lord, in light of the heavenly riches you've given to me, I, I just want to invest in your kingdom, not because I've got to, but because I get to. I'm not saying that uh, just because you have this rest relationship with God, you're not going to find yourself saying, wow, you know, studying God's Word, it's such a beautiful thing. Oh, just the wonderful insights that, that I get from all that. But Lord, it's all you. You're the only one who can open up my eyes to all of it. But understand the, the, the crucial fork in the road, the difference between rest and stress in our walk with God is understanding who does the work. Who am I trusting in? Am I trusting on what I do for God, the basis of my peace, or am I trusting in what Jesus and Jesus alone has done for me? See, that's how you enter into rest. By faith, in what God has done for you, not faith in anything you could ever do for God. And the difference that can make in our life, I, I love what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28 and following. He said, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. Is that how you feel? Are you weary? Are you heavy laden? Do you feel like your walk with God is some kind of big, drudge kind of man all these got to's and and if i don't do this and and if i'm not at that meeting and and if, if i fall asleep while the pastor's preaching or or you know don't do that i mean that's really bad. but uh if if i don't keep up my end of the bargain god's not gonna love me anymore understand you can never keep up your end of the bargain if you could keep up your end of the bargain, there was no reason for Jesus to die for you. Jesus said, come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you something really heavy to carry. Is that what he said? <laughs> no. He said, I will give you what? Rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. How do you know if you're pursuing Jesus properly? How do you know if you're doing it right? You find rest for your soul. Because Jesus said, my yoke is easy and my burden's light. Now understand, there's a yoke here. You know, a, a yoke in that day and age was something you would put on an ox that would allow it to, to pull and to plow. But a, an ox was considered such a valuable piece of livestock. It was like the John Deere tractor of the era. And you would have a yoke that precisely fit on that ox's shoulders. And you would also have a second ox that would be trained to walk in perfect cadence with the other ox. And if you took some other ox's yoke and put it on another ox, all it would do would chafe the shoulders and it wouldn't fit. If you put another ox they hadn't been trained to walk with, they, they would go back and forth. You wouldn't have straight furrows in the, the soil you were preparing. And sooner or later you would ruin, absolutely ruin those oxen. There's one yoke that fits exactly right. And it's the yoke that God has prepared for you. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly heart. You'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden's light. If I'm struggling, if you're struggling and straining and striving, if you're what you call walk with God is some big heavy trip, Maybe the yoke's on you. <laughs> Pardon the expression. Maybe you're wearing somebody else's yoke. Maybe you're wearing a yoke that God never intended you to bear. And the biggest yoke that tears up and ruins more believers you can shake a stick at, that makes them like that scared horse believer, like, oh, God's looking for any reason to kick me out of the kingdom. The yoke that we take upon ourselves is self-righteousness not Savior righteousness, not looking at Jesus, looking at me, looking at what I do for God, not looking at what the Lord has done for me. Now, if that's the problem, it's also the prescription. If you're heavy laden and burdened, if you're stressed out, get your eyes back on Jesus. Not only look to Jesus, not only agree that Jesus died for you, not only agree with Jesus' invitation to rest, but mix that promise with faith. Believe it. Believe in Jesus. It's the highest form of praise you will ever enter into. Believe what he did for you. Believe his promise. Receive it. And then, catch this, share out of the glorious overflow what God has done for you. Not out of a lack, but out of an overflow. At rest, David writes, creation demonstrates, Joshua illustrates, is available for you and me tonight. Let's pray and ask the Lord to bring us back to that place of peace and rest in our walk with God. Father, I thank you that there is such a huge difference between religion and a relationship with you. And I thank you, Lord, that even though it assaults our pride and humbles us utterly because all our righteousness, your word says, is like filthy rags in your sight, even the most pure things that we think we do, we've all got mixed motives and, and all kinds of things where maybe we get it right and then we see other people praising us for being right and we take the praise and it's... So you know how easily we can tie ourselves up in a knot. Even when we get it right, we get it wrong. But thank you, Lord, that Jesus never got it wrong. Thank you for his perfect life. And thank you, Lord, that your son was willing to take that perfect life and die on a cruel Roman cross to pay the price for all of our sins, to make us right. And, Lord, when your son cried out, it is finished, Lord, forgive us for the times we've read that and maybe agreed with it, but then said, oh, I don't know, maybe it's to be continued. Maybe I've got to add something to what Jesus has already done. 
Help us to realize we can't add a single thing to what you've done for us. And when we realize the enormity of your grace and the enormity of your love and the enormity of what you've done for us, oh Lord, keeping that first and foremost at the front of our hearts and minds, that's going to lead us to a place where we're going to be so fruitful. It's going to be so beautiful. <laughs> You're going to use us in such radical ways because people are going to see the difference between religion and relationship demonstrated in us. Grant us that grace, we pray, and forgive us for those times we've made it all about us. But I mean, it's all about you, Jesus. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.